So this morning I woke up at, um, at 5 o'clock your time, which is 6 o'clock my time, if I've got the time change right, and I got to go for a run with my friend past the daffodils that are coming up in the warm weather. <laughs> and I um, got to, then I go, went to market with my husband through the beautiful warm streets of Lancaster. I came back, I saw my, my students out tanning on the lawns, and then I came here. And I'm coming here to do some, what you want to do, we're coming to do math together, which is what, what else would any student want to do on a Friday evening and a Saturday but to do math together. This is wonderful, so I'm glad that we are all here for this. I'm going to be telling you about some stuff that I do about mathematics together with art. Um, about 15 years ago, I decided that, that I really wanted to try to bring art into my math classes. Why? Because you know what it's like when you tell people that you're interested in math. They say, oh, you must be so smart. Oh, I was never any good at math. And I thought, oh, people are so scared at math. If I do the art side, then they're going to really, they'll love the art, and that will help them to learn math. So I thought, math is hard, art is the easy part, and we'll mix these together. And I found out, actually, that I had it backwards. <laughs> um, that my students who come in have all had math last year. The, my, my freshmen in college, they all had math in high school, their senior year. But they haven't had art since sixth grade. So they draw like little kids, and they're embarrassed. If I asked you right now to draw a picture, you would be terrified, and they are too. And when I say that my students are embarrassed about their art, well, let me actually show you some examples. These are actual, typical um, pieces of art that my students turn in. So. Um, so this first piece is Tim, Tim Tillman. He's 18 years old, and this is what he turned he was He was terribly embarrassed when he handed this to me on the first day of class. This was his summer assignment. He had all summer to draw this. And um, he was even more embarrassed when I put it up on the wall for everybody to see. Um, but, but everybody else draws like this. This is, this is Sid. Sid wants to become a film director. Actually, now he is a film director. Um, but you can see, like, he's so bad at drawing things, he has to label everything. Like, look, this is an object. <laughs> Thank you, Sid. That's very helpful, right? Even my strongest students are really, I shouldn't say sucky, they're really bad artists. This is Kara. Kara was a student. She was so good as a student that her sophomore year, she won a full scholarship for the rest of her, her college career, her sophomore, junior, senior year. She struggled so hard with this. You can see she wants to tell you that there's something happening in space, and she wants to give you the sense of things moving around in space, and she just can't figure out how to do it. They're so frustrated. They're so, it's really, really hard. So what happens during my course, during this one semester, though, the two or th the three months that I have together with them, how, does, how do my students' arts change in one semester? Well, this is the same three students at the end of the semester. This is Tim's. He was not embarrassed by this. As a matter of fact, like many of my students, he tur would turn it in, and then he came back and said, can I have it back to photocopy it because I want to show my parents, right? <laughs> now, none of my students ever come back and say, can I photocopy my calculus test because I want to, no, they don't want to show their parents their calculus test, but they want it, isn't that good? That's really good. Okay, Sid, this was Sid. Sid was still labeling things, but now it was out of pride. This is my building, my building, Sid's building, Sid's building right? Yeah, good stuff, showing off, the, the now showing the vote. Yeah, lots of labels. And did Kara ma manage to master a sense of space? Yes, she did. This, this is her freshman dorm. This is where she lived her first year. So something happened in these three months that transformed picture A to picture B. What was it? Is it because I teach them art? No, I don't know anything really much about art. I know math. This is math. So what kinds of math questions lie hidden in these pictures? Well, here's an example. Um, how did Kara know that these angles in this picture represent angles that are right angles in the real world? They're not all right angles in this picture. There are a whole bunch of different angles. How did she know that? Or, let's see Sid's picture. He has these towers, and he has these towers right there in the middle. And they're in the right place. They look like they're in the right place to you. As a matter of fact, one of the things that I do is I grade for accuracy. I go and I check. They're in the right place. But how, when he drew them, they weren't there. So how did he know to put them there? Right? You can also see that there's a lot of lines. There's a lot of repetition. That's really, really important. Um, 
As a matter of fact, the, the final assignment, they don't get an A unless they have at least 700 lines in this picture. And the lines have to be in the right place. And yes, I actually go and I count all the lines in their artwork. Um, it's not as hard as you think because there is a lot of repetition, so we can multiply. Um, but, <laughs> but what I mean by being right, look at these tiles. In the, the, the sidewalk tiles, these are supposed to be, in the real world, the same length. But you can see, like, this one doesn't quite cover my hand, and this one definitely more than covers my hand. They look right. They are, they are right. But how does he know how to make those so that they look like they're the same size? Right? These are really good questions. They're really good questions. They're questions that an artist would actually want to, to know the answer to. It's not just some like made-up math question. How do you know how to do this? Well, the way that, that people, mathematicians and artists and engineers, started figuring out this question was a long time ago, um, back when we started learning um, map making and dome building and lens making. But back in the Renaissance, this looks like a picture postcard. It looks like, like somebody came along with a camera. Um, this is by a guy named Canaletto. It's from the 15, 1600s. And so he did not have a photographic camera to do this. He actually did use something called a camera obscura, which is like, um, sort of like a pinhole thing. He had a dark room with a hole in one wall. And the light from the outside shone on things outside and, and projected this image onto the back wall, like a movie, but upside down and backwards. You might have seen those in, um, in um, science museums. Sometimes you get to go and see one of those. So he actually used mechanical devices to make this picture, and then he would paint, paint on the wall, paint on the canvas on the wall. But many mathematicians and artists actually used real math to try to make these pictures look very realistic. So, um, so let's look at modern art. Modern art doesn't look like Canaletto's art. And part of the reason I want to show you this is because I want to have you avoid what, um, what C.S. Lewis calls chronological snobbery. That is, I don't want you to think that Canaletto is right and David Hockney is wrong, even though the picture, one picture looks right and the other picture looks wrong. Hockney knows how to make beautiful perspective art. And he actually knows how to take these rules, and he's breaking them for a reason. Here's um, showing you that he actually does know. This is Hockney. He's, Hockney is an amazing artist, right? He does know how to make things look very, very realistic. Look at that person. It's beautiful. And yet the table, there's something wonky about the table. He loves what he calls wonky perspective. He's breaking the rules for a reason. What's the reason? The reason, I think, is best explained by um, a modern philosopher that you might have heard of. I'm, I'm guessing many of you have actually read this modern philosopher. He's named Marmaduke. Um, yeah, so, and she's saying, no, this painting isn't influenced by Picasso. My model wouldn't sit still. Well, when you think about a person that you love and when you think about a house that you've been in, you don't think about it like a picture postcard, just sitting there and not moving. You think about it from all different kinds of angles. Anybody with a camera or even a cell phone can take a photograph, but an artist wants to try to capture this experience of moving around that, and that's what David Hockney is trying to do. But in order to know how to do this, in order to know how to break the rules so that you're walking around the chair, you have to know what the rules are. So we're going to go back and do things the, the right perspective way and just remember that modern artists aren't, aren't stupid. That's OK. All right. So let's go back to one of my favorite Renaissance artists. Um, this, is a, this was an etching by a guy named Albrecht Durer. Albrecht Durer, oh, he was amazing. Um, this is a, an etching called Melancholy. It's an angel who's looking very sad. Why is the angel sad? Nobody knows for sure, but I think it's because the angel can't figure out how to solve a math problem um, and is working hard on it. There's a lot of really nice mathematical imagery in here. Up in this corner, you can see there's a magic square. It has numbers in it. All the, the rows and all the columns and the diagonals add up to the same thing. Um, there's, there's a compass here that, that um, mathematicians would use for geometry, for measuring um, things. There's a scale up there. There's a lot of other really nice sort of mathematical imagery in here. And we know that Albrecht Durer actually loved both art and mathematics. Um, this is too much information. Don't pay too much attention to it. Um, the, the top thing is um, many people date the beginning of perspective with Brunelleschi, who did this really cool picture of a dome. So that was up, up there in the, the around 1400. Um, Albrecht Durer was born after him. We know that Albrecht Durer loved math. He translated Euclid's works himself from Latin into German. Um, 
And we also know that he really wanted to get his hand on the cool mathematical theory of perspective. Many people believe that in 1509 he did. Um, that he traveled somewhere and that we think he got a, a, a book on how to do this. And in 1525, he actually wrote his own book called A Painter's Manual. We'll see some pages from that in a little while. But what happened in 1509 that makes us think that before then he didn't know perspective, mathematical perspective, and after then he did, it was things like, like this. Before 1509, this was what Durer's pieces looked like. This is a piece called St. Jerome in the Wilderness, Penitent in the Wilderness. Uh, we know it's St. Jerome because he's followed by a lion. The story says that St. Jerome had plucked a thorn out of a lion's paw, and the lion, in gratitude, decided not only not to eat him, but to follow him around purring kindly and never eating him for the rest of his life. So, um, so there's St. Jerome. And if you look at this, you can see it's a really beautiful picture. There's a lot of nice proportions in it, but the sense of depth is really conveyed um, it's almost atmospherically. There's not a lot of straight lines. There is a, a house, but it's way up in the distance. It's really tiny. You can't see it. Um, really, the only way that we know it's far away is because it's much smaller than the guy's head, right? And houses aren't really that small. Um, that's before 1509. This was in 14, nine, 1496 that he did this. After 1509, Albrecht Durer could do this. This is St. Jerome, again, the St. Jerome that you guys have in has handouts. And so here he is with a lion. But now look at the sense of depth. It's really conveyed by the room. And the room and the razor sharp lines. So we knew he got his hands on the secret that you guys are going to get of mathematical perspective. So the fact that he had this cool math didn't mean that was the only thing he did. Like many artists, once you have the rules, you, you're free to use them or not as you want. He made this particular piece the same time that he made Melancholy, also the same time that he made this piece, which is called Night, the Death, and the Devil. And, um, and again, this one doesn't have the razor sharp lines, but once you have a tool, you can use it if you want. That's a great thing. Okay. Um, in 1525, Durer published this wonderful book called A Painter's Manual that um, might actually even be on, in your library's in your campus's library. I know it's in Franklin and Marshall's library. We have a copy, the, um, which is just, it's beautiful. We've got the original German, and we've also, thank goodness for me, got a translated copy, because not only is German hard for me, but his handwriting is really tricky. Um, but this is what's in the painter's manual. It might surprise you that this is a lot of what it is. Things like this. You wouldn't think that this is what a painter would be thinking about, like, how do I draw these letters? But if you use your computer and you see how many different fonts there are when you scroll down, you realize that fonts are a really important deal for people who are putting visual information out there. And just like a mathematician, he has this long, long, long explanation for E. It's like a theorem, and then F is just this corollary, which reduces the previous case, right? So um, he has a lot of talk about how to draw geometric solids. Um, a lot of just very simple geometry and, and straightforward letters. And it's really only towards the very end of this book that he gets towards things that you and I might even think of as drawing or painting. He has this picture here, long, long, long description of how to draw something like a cube. You see there's a cube, there's a light, Licht, there's a mysterious floating eyeball, everything's labeled all over the place. And then the next page, um, he says, you know, you erase some of the lines, you shade things in, and you've got a cube, you've got a shadow, you've got the light, and you've got a mysterious floating eyeball. Um, he had lots of different ways of trying to draw, draw things in perspective. He was not at all a one-trick pony. Um, in addition to this cube thing, he had lovely descriptions of how to draw a person. And this way that you're drawing a person is you're looking through some kind of a glass thing. I don't imagine he was drawing on glass. I don't know what it was that he was drawing that was, that was see-through. But you're drawing this person, and you've got your eye next to some stylus so that your eye doesn't wiggle around. So you're just looking in one place, and so you can draw the person. Um, that's one method he had. Here's another method. Um, if you read an art history book that, that talks about perspective, you're likely to see this particular picture. Um, it's been in many different books that I've seen. And it, because it's reproduced so often, I thought I would tell you exactly what's going on, because this is a rather incredible setup. So what happens if you want to draw a lute in perspective? A lute is this mu beautiful musical instrument. It's beautiful to look at, and it's also beautiful to listen to. For this, you need two people. This guy holds a stick, like a chopstick, it was, probably wasn't a chopstick, but a stick, just a wooden stick, tied to a rope. And he points the stick at some place on the loop. And the rope comes up here through this frame. We'll come back to the frame. Up to the little bolt on the wall. And then it comes down, and there's a weight on the other end of the rope. And that weight, the, the object of that weight is to keep the rope very straight. The string is really straight. 
Okay? So that's, that's guy A. His job is just to point at the loot. Um, while he's pointing at the loot, guy B gets busy. And what he's doing is he's taking two more pieces of string. He's attaching one up and down to the frame and another side to side in the frame so that the three strings, his two string and his one string, cross at exactly one point. Does that make sense? So they're all crossing there. OK, once you've got that, you attach this with wax. You attach it with wax this way and that way. Then what you do is this canvas is actually on hinges. See there's hinges here? OK, so guy A lets go of his pointer. You swing the canvas shut. And then where those two strings were, you put a dot. Then you open up the canvas, and you do this again. You point at another place. So this was the original dot matrix printer. <laughs> and it was probably just about as fast. I cannot imagine that anybody ever did this. There's so much measurement error involved in this. This is crazy. But lots of people love reproducing this picture, because, oh, yeah, that's how you do perspective. Um, I really don't believe that, that anybody ever did this. As a matter of fact, Albrecht Dürer dedicated this book, this 1525 book, to his good friend, Perkheimer, who sent a copy to his sister, who was an abbess. And this is what the abbess said. She said, a book has now reached us dedicated to you about painting and measurement. Um, our, our gracious duke bound it for us, presented it to our painters. We enjoyed it, but she thinks she doesn't need it. She can practice her art just as well without it, right? So Siskel and Ebert are no longer with us, but they would have, right, two thumbs down. Um, Nonetheless, Durer came out with another edition two years later in 1527 where he included a couple more ways of doing perspective. Up at the top, you can see that you're looking through some glass kind of thing again through a tube. The tube is connected to a string up on the wall. In some way, that like puts your eye further back from the canvas. We'll see why that's important later on. And this is um, if you want to draw a naked woman, you tell her to lie down in front of a grid and you stand here next to this rather exotic looking stylus and you copy what you see on this grid down onto this grid. Maybe you guys have done that like with Sunday comics. We did that, we make a little comic into a big comic. But you can also do it, right, if you want with naked women. Um, but that's not actually what we're talking about today. We're talking about this. <laughs> and this, I claim, is math. How do we know this is math? Well, I mean, look, he labeled everything. I mean, how does a mathematician tell a bedtime story, right? We say, once upon a time, there were three bears, B1, B2, B3, right? He's labeling all his points. It's got to be math. All right, so let's, let's go look at the math that Albrecht Durer was using. Um, I was trying to be gender neutral here, so I was using a squirrel to look at things. <laughs> I don't know about your campus. We have a lot of squirrels. So, okay. Perspective painting begins with a very simple idea. And the simple idea is that light travels in straight lines. Now, Albrecht Dürer and Leonardo da Vinci and the many other mathematician, uh, uh, engineer, artists of his day, they didn't know how we saw. They didn't know about photons. They thought that there was some eminence in our eyes, that if we close our eyes, we keep the life force inside of it, and we open our eyes, and something just shoots right out of our eyes and grabs onto stuff, and that's how we see. In the same way that if I want to feel this podium over here, I have to reach out my hand and touch. So there's something for me that goes to the podium. But they knew that you can't see around corners, even though you can feel around corners. They knew about the straight line thing. And once you have straight lines, you're in the realm of math. So, cool. Great. All right, so what we're going to do to make a painting, we stick the painting in there. The painting is a canvas. The canvas is, a, for our purposes, it's a plane. You can paint on other things, but we're going to paint on planes. And the idea is, so you got this photon, this green photon. Oh, uh, gosh, there's a physicist here. I'm sorry, green photon is really bad physics. Sorry about this, but that's what we're going to do. OK, green photon, zip, zoop, straight to you. It zips along in a line. The line intersects a plane and a point, because a line and a plane intersect in a point. So where that point is, you put a little green blob of paint. Okay. And then here's the brown, that's even worse physics, a brown photon zoop, zips here. You put a little brown blob of paint. You do this for all the light rays that are going to the squirrel's eye. And what happens is if, and this is a really weird if, but mathematicians love this, right? If the squirrel stands there, doesn't move, and only looks with one eye, right? Then you could take away the world, and the squirrel wouldn't know because the picture would look just like the world had looked, right? That's the idea of perspective painting. And that if, which is so bizarre, is why David Hockney really loves doing crazy pictures, because he thinks it's boring. OK. Um, so let's, let's just, we're using this setup. 
your, your eye is a point, you're looking at a plane, um, and light rays come in in lines, and notice that there's really cool consequences that come about because of this. So one of the consequences that's going to be important to us is that things that are further away from us have smaller images on the canvas. They appear smaller to us. And it's not philosophical. It's not because we're humans and things that are close to us are important and, so we, and things that are big are important so we draw them. No, 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 no. It's because this tree and this tree are the same size in the real world, but this one is further away so it subtends a smaller angle and so therefore it has a smaller image on the canvas. That's why that works, okay? And this is so, so obvious and yet so important. We are all going to do an experiment right now just to verify that this is true. What I would like you to do is take your hands and put them on the side of your head. If you all do it at the same time, you don't look stupid. And then you tell me, which is, this is not a hard question, which is bigger, your hands or your head? Your, which, hands or your head, which is bigger? Your, your head, right? Yes? Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> It's late, I know. We've been up since 5 this morning. Okay, now hold your hands out and look at my head and see which looks bigger. Yeah, your hands look bigger, and it's not because I have a weeny little head, right? It's because my head is further away. It subtends a smaller angle, so it has a smaller image. Some people feel like you're not doing mathematics unless you're doing algebra. So we'll do just a tiny little bit of algebra. although although with deference to the liberal arts, of the original seven liberal arts, um, so there was the trivium, which was dialectic and rhetoric and grammar, um, but the, the quadrivium had four things, and it had arithmetic, it had geometry, it had music, and it had astronomy, no algebra, no calculus. Algebra had not yet come over from India and Arabia and stuff, so arithmetic and geometry, um, both Greek words. Okay, but we're going to do a little bit of, of algebra here anyway. Um, the neat thing about this setup is that you can use algebra, you can use similar triangles. So the height of the object in the real world, that's big H, is to the distance to the artist in the real world, that's big D, that's that big triangle right there, is similar to the small triangle, the height of the image dis divided by the distance to the image, right? This very simple triangle. This little simple formula, which seems so easy, is the formula that makes Toy Story look 3D, right? Flintstones and Simpsons, they're very flat cartoons. How do you render Shrek in 3D? That's a really interesting math question. Once you have him in 3D and you put him onto a 2D canvas, how does he still look 3D? It's that formula right there. So if you want to go to Pixar, write that down, okay? It looks like a really simple formula, but it has amazing consequences. And just to show that, I'm going to give you a problem that I bet none of your professors know how to solve, just using this little similar triangle. So here's this, the simple problem. You've got a, a squirrel sitting on a pedestal, because that's cause clip art, okay. And um, <laughs> in the real world, this cubical pedestal is the same on all sides, right? But in the image, the back of the image is smaller than the front of the image because of this thing that we did right there. And that's actually something you can put your ruler down. You can measure it on a photograph. You can measure it on a picture. So suppose you decide, you measure this and you find that on the picture, the back side is nine-tenths the side of the front side, then how far was the artist from the squirrel? Similar triangles. Go figure it out. Okay? I'm not telling you the answer. If you want to try to come and tell me tomorrow, I'll tell you if you're right. Okay? That's the algebra. We're not going to do a lot of algebra here because most artists don't. So we're going to do geometry, because many artists do. So light travels in straight lines. That actually has really important consequences for when we're looking at a bunch of straight lines in the world, when we're looking at a bunch of windows or sidewalks going back into the distance, bricks and things like that. So, um, so I'm going to say something that sounds really obvious. When you're looking at something, you can see it, and when you're not looking at it, you can't see it. Here's my squirrel. My squirrel can look at all these lines, look through this, so here's the picture plane, looking at these lines. And I just chose three directions at random. In these three directions, the squirrel can see the line. So I would put little blue dots here, OK? But there's one direction, I claim, that the squirrel can look and see the picture plane, but not see any of these lines, even if these lines are really infinitely long, even if they're not line segments. Here's four lines. Even if those lines are infinitely long, there's one direction that the squirrel can look and see the canvas and not see those lines. What direction is that? Why don't you guys think, 
think and then tell the person next to you what you think dire that direction would be. The person next to you hears you better if you move your lips. Does anybody have an idea? Anybody? Yeah, you. Up, up here? Yeah. At the top part? Um, okay, yeah, I guess that's true. Imagine there's another li more lines okay. up there. Okay, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's good. Good answer. Not the one I wanted, though. <laughs> anybody have the one I wanted? Yeah. Oh, that P word. Say that P word again. Parallel. If my squirrel is, remember, no, no, it's a line of sight. It's not a cone of sight. If the squirrel's looking through a straw, if the squirrel is looking parallel to these lines, then his line or her line of sight never intersects those blue lines, and so the squirrel cannot see them. Right? That is, at every other place on the canvas, you can see these lines, but right there on the canvas, all those lines appear to vanish. That's the vanishing point. If you hear artists talking about vanishing point, they often talk about it as converging lines. The reason that they look like they're converging is because if I'm looking parallel to this line, I'm also looking parallel to this line. So if this line vanishes, so does this one. So those two lines vanish in the same place. But it really means you can't see the lines. That's what vanishing means. It means you can't see it because you're looking parallel to it, so you can't see it. That's the vanishing point. All right, so this is a math talk, so we'll do some theorems. Here's the three theorems we're going to use. We're going to draw a cube together. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's actually, I'm, I'm, I'm um, underestimating how much fun. This is going to be the most amazing cube that you have ever drawn. And you're laughing, and I'm not, and I'm not kidding about that, actually. <laughs> OK, so here's our three theorems. The first one is, I'm really not kidding. If a collection of parallel lines in the real world is parallel to the canvas, OK, so what does it mean for a line to be parallel to the canvas? So the, the canvas is a plane. So you imagine it's going on forever and ever, because we're mathematicians. And a line also goes on forever and ever. If the line never intersects the plane, then the line and the plane are parallel. Okay. Um, if that collection of real world lines in the real world is parallel to the canvas, then their images on the canvas will be parallel to each other and also to the lines in the real world. Okay. If you have a collection of parallel lines in the real world that's not parallel to the canvas, like those lines would pierce through the canvas at some point, then their images will converge to the same vanishing point, right? Because when you're looking parallel to one of them, you're looking parallel to all of them. Um, but even more amazing, something that, that most artists don't think about, a single line in the real world can have a vanishing point all by itself, right? And that makes sense, right? If you draw the two railroad tracks going back into the distance, and then and they converge right there on the horizon. And then somebody comes and steals the left railroad track. You don't have the right one just going up into the sky because the left one went away, right? That doesn't make any sense. So the right one would still vanish on the horizon all by itself. OK, so let's draw a cube. We're going to draw a cube in something called one point perspective. And that means the front edge of the cube is going to be parallel to the canvas. So we're going to start like this, OK? So this is a picture. This is not the cube. This is the image of the cube. The real cube is like on the other side of here. And in the, in the real cube, the, these two lines are parallel to each other. So they have images that are parallel on the canvas. And those two lines are, par are parallel in the real world. So they have images parallel on the canvas. That's theorem one. Okay. Now, when I started learning to draw cubes when I was in elementary, high school, that I, what I would do is I'd take a square. And then I would take another square exactly the same size and move it up and over and connect it with a bunch of parallel lines. OK. Now, is that a perspective image of a cube? No, why not? Because the back side has to be smaller than the front side, right? Because of that thing that we did. So, so that thing that I drew was, in some sense, it was a good symbol of the cube. The same way like this right here is a good symbol of a heart. That's not really what your heart looks like, unless you're in really bad shape, right? <laughs> And that, that thing that we draw that's called the Necker cube is a good symbol for a cube, but that's not really what we see when we look at a cube. So how would we draw a cube? Anybody have an idea of what we should do next? 
We should, we should put a, a point. Somebody was saying a vanishing point. OK. Uh, where should we put the vanishing point? Actually, this is a good question, right? If you're an artist, you have to think, OK, where do I put the vanishing point? Tell the person next to you, where do you put the vanishing point? OK, anybody have a good idea? Can you say that louder? Wherever you want. Is that true? Anything goes? Minnesota's a really free place, I guess. Um, OK, well, that's, that's sort of true. That's sort of true. OK, but hang on. So, let's, so what I want to do is I got tired of drawing squirrels, uh, but I'm not a really good artist, so I'm going to have to explain this to you. Oh my gosh, this is so bad. <laughs> OK, so this is the side view. This is a guy looking. Hang on here. That's his ear. That's his eye. That's his nose. OK? <laughs> yeah? There's hair. He's got a little bit of hair coming off the back. That's the side view. And he's picture plane and the canvas. Um, what's this up here? I can't tell my left from my right, so I made him a cyclops. <laughs> that's his ears. That's his one eye. That's his nose. Yeah, Mark, Mark, my colleague, Mark has, um, has the guy looking out of his nose, so we don't have to <laughs> worry about left and right. So he gives him two eyes. But OK, so this is uh, Odin was a one-eyed one -eyed, uh, Norse god, so we call this guy Odin. This is Odin looking at the cube, OK? Now, the picture that I drew already had the front side of the cube. It already had this right here. And we're just trying to figure out where the vanishing point goes. When does a line vanish when we're not looking at it? When are we not looking at it when we're looking parallel to it? So we're trying to draw this line. So the line vanishes when Odin is looking parallel to it. But notice that that will depend not only on where the cube is, but also on where, and particularly where Odin is, right? If he sits down and he's lower, then the vanishing point will go down lower. And if he's standing up high, then the vanishing point will move up higher. So the vanishing point actually tells you something about where the artist is. Isn't that amazing? It really does. It, it, the vanishing point doesn't tell you about where things in the real world were. It tells you where the artist was. So in this particular plan view, I have Odin standing up above the cube. So we're going to put the vanishing point up above the cube. And he's off to the right or the left. And so we're going to put the vanishing point off to the right or the left of the cube, like, like, like that. OK. Notice, remember this picture of Canaletto? This is something in one point perspective. We know it's in one point perspective because in the real world, these lines are vertical, and their images here are vertical. In the real world, these lines are horizontal, and their images here are horizontal. But in the real world, this was probably a level pathway. It probably wasn't going up like this. And this really was probably a level roof. It probably wasn't going down like that. And you can see, if you hold up your fingers and cover those lines, you can see that the vanishing point is somewhere off over here. What that means is that when Canaletto was painting this picture, he was not standing here in the middle painting it. He was standing off to one side painting, and he was painting everything towards this side of him. And if you want to see this so that it looks really 3D and it just sort of pops into beautiful perspective, you don't stand in the middle like the rest of the tourists. You come over here to this side and you go, wow, I feel like I'm in the space. It's really, it's an amazing experience. So knowing where the vanishing point is tells you something about where to stand. Okay? So yes, you can put it wherever you want, but then other things are determined. Okay. So I'm going to put the vanishing point up there because we said Odin was up there and over. Okay. Oh, sorry, this is taking a long time to draw just a little cube, right? OK, so what do I do next? Yeah, I've just got to put in the back lines, right? And then we're all done, so I'll go ahead and do that for you. And then we'll have our cube. Look, there's the back line, and then we put the, and that's my cube. Isn't this a great cube? Do you like this cube? Is it a cube? Yeah? Yeah? You guys don't seem very happy. You like this? Is it a cube? Now, my colleague, Mark France, who actually trained first as an artist and then as a mathematician, you know, when you, when you turn in your math papers, it's like you do it, nobody else sees it, and you give it to your professor, and your professor grades it. It's like, it's like this private communication between the two of you, right? But that's not how art works. In art, you, you, get, you put your stuff up on the wall, and everybody comes around and laughs. I mean, and, crit and makes amazing pictures of you. And when Mark was in art school, he would, like, he would get up from his drawings, and he would go, and he would look at other people and go, oh, that's so cool. Oh, that's so cool. Oh, that's so cool. And he'd get back to his and he'd go, oh, did I draw a cube or did I draw a dumpster? <laughs> OK, so we'll have a vote here. Is this a cube or a dumpster? How many people think it's a cube? 
Okay, wait, nobody's there. Okay, so usually at least one person will raise their hand. How many people think it's a dumpster? Good. Well, I'm right and you're wrong. It's a cube. <laughs> Actually, it is. But, um, but it doesn't look like it to you guys, does it? So there's something funky going on. How do we know where to put that back line? Did I put it in the right? What, what's going on here? So let's go back to that plan view, because I want to try to convince you this really is a cube, even though you guys are all voting against me. Um, so here's Odin from above, my, my Cyclops. And I'm going to do one of those things that you just, you sort of hate it when your professors do it. Just do something that comes out of nowhere. I'm going to draw a diagonal orange line across the top of the box. Okay? Why? It's going to be important later. You just have to trust me about this. But notice this diagonal orange line, is it parallel to the picture plane? I'm staring into the light so I can't see you, so you actually have to say it out loud. No, okay, good. It's not parallel to the picture plane. And therefore, by theorem three, which says a single line all by itself can have a vanishing point, this orange line has a vanishing point. Where is the vanishing point? The vanishing point happens when we're not looking at it. When are we not looking at this line? When we're looking parallel to it. So when Odin is looking parallel to this orange line, he can't see it, and therefore there's a vanishing point right there on the picture plane. Right? Notice also, since this is on the top of the, of the cube, even though this is a diagonal line, it's a horizontal diagonal line. Does that make sense? So where is it going to vanish? It's going to vanish somewhere on the horizon. So it has this cool vanishing point right up there. There's the diagonal line going back off and to the horizon. So that's an infinitely long orange, the image of an infinitely long orange line. Does that make sense? OK. So it's a cube. Oh, hang on. There's more. OK. <laughs> um, is it a cube? It was a cube when I did this in practice. Yeah, no, it's a cube. OK, so hang on. So look, if this is a cube and not a dumpster, then this triangle is the best triangle in math, right? Because what kind of a triangle is this if this is a cube? It's an isosceles right triangle, right? 45, 45, 90 triangle. These two legs are the same size. They're the best. It's the best triangle in math. Does anybody see another copy? This is like highlights, like search for these things. Thing. Anybody see another isosceles right triangle in there? On the other side over here, right, there's another one. Good. Any others? Over here, there's another one, right? Because Odin's line of sight to this vanishing point is parallel to this side of the cube. And Odin's line of sight to that vanishing point is parallel to this diagonal. And the, the, cube, the plane itself is parallel to the front and to the back of the cube. So that's another isosceles triangle, meaning that this length right here is the same as this length right here. But wait, this is on the picture, right? That is something that we can measure. Let's go back and look at this here. OK, I can't point up this high, so I'm going to use my mouse over here. We just said that Odin has to be looking straight out from this point. And how far away does he have to be? He has to be this far away, this distance, right? That means that when Odin was painting this picture, he was on a giant ladder up here exactly this far away. Do you see, do you see right, right up there? He was up, up there, just as high as that black point. And so his nose or his eye and that black point and that orange point form a 45, 45, 90 triangle. And when we get up on the ladder up here and look at this, you guys will look down this and go, oh my gosh, this is a cube. Did, Chris, did you bring the ladder? Oh, that's right. The lawyers said we could not put a ladder up on the stage. It's liability purposes. But you'd have to trust me. It would be really good. But fortunately, we have, we have a proxy. You have this lovely yellow page. I want you to grab this. This is a picture of something that's clearly not a cube to you guys. OK? It's definitely a dumpster. The, the main vanishing point is that that mysterious floating eyeball, same as Durer. And the viewing distance is the distance between the I and the X. So what you want to do is you want to hold this out like this, sort of perpendicular to you. You will close one eye, and you'll bring your eye in to bring the picture in close until, the, until your, picture's, your eye is very close to that eye. And then look over at that cube. Do you see how I'm doing this? And then you say, oh my gosh, <laughs> it's a cube. And then you pull it back. And, no, it's a dumpster. And then you bring it back in. No, it's a cube. Oh my gosh. This is the most amazing cube I have ever seen. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah, I wasn't kidding. <laughs> oh my gosh, you could do this like all day long. 
What else would college students do on Friday night? <laughs> Good. And the neat thing about this is that it doesn't just work for some hokey little cube that I made. Okay, so is this a cube or a dumpster? In some ways, it is a cube, but it's a bad cube for you guys because you are not up this high, right? You're way down low, and you're not that close. You're way far away. So a good artist actually takes the viewer into consideration when deciding where those vanishing points need to go. Um, but the cool thing is that you can do this with real art, too. So let's practice with Albrecht Dürer, St. Jerome. So this is a piece that's in one point perspective. Oh, so these pieces of paper, by the way, I'm like one of these like eco nuts. If you want to, you can keep this, but you're, you're absolutely welcome. But if you don't want to keep it, that's okay with me. Just give it back to me, and then I'll use it again some other time so we don't make lots of trash. Okay, so if you want to keep it and you want to draw on it, you can. When you go to a museum to look at art, Here's a little, a little hint. If you draw on the art, the curators get really angry, so you shouldn't do that. But you can bring along like chopsticks and hold them up from very far away, and you can see that you can cover lines with your chopsticks and see where the vanishing points are. So you're welcome to try to do that with, with this piece or with your piece. So this is a piece that's in one point perspective. You can see that these vertical lines in the picture represent lines that are vertical in the real world. They're all parallel in the picture. And there's a bunch of horizontal lines in the picture that represent horizontal lines in the real world. So that's two of the directions being parallel to the canvas, but there's a third direction that's not parallel to the canvas. And can anybody see where that, that third direction of points, where they vanish, where they converge those lines? Yeah, off towards this side over here. All right, so here's some lines, like I extended this um, window ledge, and I extend that line in the window, and some rafters, and you can see they converge over here. I think my picture is cropped slightly differently than yours, but it's, it's off to this side. And this, this particular place makes a lot of sense as the primary vanishing point, that you're supposed to be somewhere out from here. How do you know? Because if you look below the horizon here, you see the tops of things, you see the top of the table. If you look above this horizon line, you see the, the bottoms of things, like you see the bottom of that hat, right? And notice by standing over here, you see one side of objects. You see that side of the table. So you know you're supposed to be on this side of the table. Right? OK, so that tells us that when we're looking at this page, we're supposed to be looking at it not from the middle, but off towards one side. But how close or how far? Boy, it would be nice if there was like a cube in there or a square in there. Does anybody see anything that we could use that would be like a cube or a Maybe the tabletop. Now, I once read an art historian who said Durer thought he was such a great artist. That table's supposed to be a square, and it's really a trapezoid, and he just completely messed it up. No, it was not Durer who messed it up. Sorry, it was the art historian. This tabletop is supposed to be a, the image of a square. If you look at it from the right place, it is. Um, we could do that same trick. We could draw the diagonal across the top of that square, connect it up to the horizon, and you see that the viewing distance is about that far away. On your picture, it's about six inches. So if you take this picture, look to the left of St. Jerome's head, and bring it in to about five or six inches away, and then look at this space, all of a sudden, to me at least, the space becomes so much more 3D. You're in the room. Like, roll your eye up and look at that gourd. To me, it looks like it's about to fall on me. It's so cool. I love this. And it's so much fun to go to a museum and see a piece properly in correct perspective. What does this mean about what you guys should be doing when I said going to museums? Imagine you get to see like Raphael's Marriage of the Virgin, which is this eight foot tall painting. It's beautiful. Here it is, eight feet tall. And the viewing distance is eight feet. It's amazing. You stand there before and you're like, wow, I'm in the courtyard with these guys getting married, OK? Now, if you can't afford to take a trip to Italy and you just get, can afford like a fancy art history book where they shrink this picture down to eight inches, then how far are you supposed to stand away from the picture to see it in all its glory? Eight inches, right? Which is a lot closer than you're used to looking at books from. And actually, eight inches is a really big picture in an art history book because usually they don't have space like that for all the pictures. So usually you'll get a three-inch picture right there. And so now how far away are you supposed to be, right? You're going to be right there. You can't, if you're old like me, you can't even focus that close, right? 
So this, this happens also with your, with your vacation pictures, right? You take this picture and you're like, oh, this is so beautiful. And then you print it out, no, this doesn't look what it looks like. That's because you're too far away from your pictures. You've got to bring them in close. So what, what, what this means is that you should go to a museum and look at pieces in the museum, not just standing in sort of the right place to get the sense of depth, but also really far back so you get the sense of composition and really up close so you can see the brushwork. It's just amazing. Um, Salvador Dali, his brushwork was so fine you couldn't even see the brushstrokes. And his paintings are really small. Like you see these masterpieces on posters and you imagine they're like four feet, eight, five feet tall, and they're like this big. You know, they're really tiny. And then, um, yeah, Van Gogh, his Starry Night, he just sloshed the paint on there in these big blobs. And there's even places where you can see the weave of the canvas because he didn't get any paint on it all. And you'd never know that from looking at a book. You just got to go and see these pieces up close and personal. So go to a museum. That's my rule. Um, you can, by the way, see the same computation algebraically if you really, if you really feel like you need to, to have algebra to make it real math. That is, if you take a photograph, the, the height of the object in the real world doesn't change when you shrink the photo. And the distance to the real world of the, to, to, of the artist to the object in the real world didn't change. When you shrink the photograph, what changes is the height of the photograph. And so therefore, your distance to that photograph should, should change correspondingly. OK, what about two-point perspective? We're going to talk a lot more about two-point perspective tomorrow. So I think I'm going to skip through this really quickly, but I want to show you one cool thing with two-point perspective, which is basically that there's, there's two vanishing points, and you're supposed to be really close to both of them. So we're going to skip through this. Don't pay no attention. This is the thing I want. No. Oh, actually, you should see that, too, because that's the book that I wrote, and you should go buy it. But no, that's not what I meant. <laughs> um, OK, so this. This is Lamise's picture. I have my students draw letters. And she did this. Um, you can see the vertical lines in this picture are vertical. And all the other lines go to one of those two funky points that are very close together. She, this was supposed to be an L. And she was so upset when it came out. She's like, it looks like a check. What did I do wrong? Well, she didn't actually draw anything wrong. But she put the vanishing points really close together, which means that you're supposed to look at it from really close up. As a matter of fact, how close? Basically, I find if I close one eye and I put my forehead on the top of the picture, look at that angle when you bring the, 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 the pink L into your head. Just look. Doesn't it go like 90 degrees on you? And it goes back out. Ooh, far away. And then comes in. Ooh, really close. And then, ooh, far away, right? It's, yeah. More fun than drugs, right? It's just, OK. Um, I'm not supposed to say that. So where you stand near a piece of art is actually really important. Now, there's a way in which this L and the cube are sort of like cool and dramatic when you're far away from them. And when you get up close, it's sort of amazing that they look right, but they're sort of boring then. Um, one of the really neat things that you can do is you can play with the rules of perspective to make things fun. This, for example, is not trick photography. And it's not one giant kid and one little kid. This is actually identical twins. And they're really standing in this room together. But this room is a trick room. Because this back wall is not a rectangle. It's a trapezoid. This is a very short wall. And it's really close to us. And that's a really tall wall. And it's really far away from us. And these windows that are put on here for extra lines are not rectangles. They're trapezoids. And these things on the floor are not squares. They're trapezoids, too. The ground tilts down. If we put a ball near her feet, it would come this way, Okay, rolling down the hill. This is called an Ames room. There's one little peephole that you look in. And the room looks like a regular room from that one peephole. And the illusion is so strong, it makes us think that the people are the wrong size, not the room. It's very cool. Ames was a perceptual psychologist. There's a lot of other cute tricks that you can do with perspective once you know how to break the rules, like this. This is my, one of my favorites, uh, called forced perspective. This is my department secretary being amazing. She's holding a student in her hand. Um, doing these trick photographies, it actually takes a lot of practice and um, a, lot of, a lot of close control. Just to show you what, what incredible um, precision it takes, here's me doing two photographs next to each other. OK, I'm not a great photographer at all. This one, you could imagine, OK, the makers of Godzilla would not hire me to do special effects. But you could imagine that if they did, that this would sort of be like Sarah standing next to a giant purse. Or at least you could pretend that I was trying to say Sarah standing next to a giant purse. right? 
Okay? But here, there's no way you would think I was trying to tell you that Sarah was standing next to a giant purse. And the only difference, I was the, I was the photographer. It was one foot in my camera, right? A huge difference in the pictures for a very small difference in where the camera's placed. So, for, so the place that you look from is really, really important for the illusion that you get. And you can see from this that there's a lot of fun that you can have when you know the rules and you break them. This is the front image to a perspective book. The, the artist was a guy named William Hogarth. Um, and he did this front piece trying to break as many rules of perspective as he could. The book is by a guy named Brooke Taylor. And some of you guys who have taken Calculus 2 have met Brooke Taylor in another guise when you did Taylor series. And if you loved Taylor series, not, then you know that this perspective book was just impossible. Nobody that I know has actually made it all the way through this book. It's really, really impossible to read. Brooke was, Mr. Taylor was not a great writer. But this piece, this perspective piece, is really lovely. And if you look at this, Durer's piece was beautiful, but you just didn't stare at his piece trying to dissect it the way that you're doing right now, right? This compels you. You want to keep looking. That's why modern artists break the rules, because it's so much more fun to look when you're breaking the rules and try to figure it out and understand it. Okay. All right. So what is it that we were supposed to learn today? Today we were supposed to learn these two things. One is that perspective art is based on, based on some really simple math similar triangles, lines, planes, and points. But it leads to some really good, tricky math problems. How do you draw a cube? Or even how far was the artist standing from that scroll on the pedestal? Right? Those are good, hard problems to solve. But also, accurate perspective viewing isn't just about what Canaletto did five or 600 years ago before you were born. It's about the relationship of you to that piece of art when you get to go see it, about where you're standing in front of that also. And if you understand those two things, then you understand what it is that I wanted you to know today. Thank you very much.